you very much and uh, good morning. It's always a pleasure to speak at the RSM. Um, slightly intimidating following uh, Jeremy, as, as always. Um, first of all, my slides are technocratic and not very colourful. Um, I have to do the corporate thing. Um, but I'm really grateful to Jeremy for clearing up one thing, which is that uh, when I was a student in Manchester, I used to walk under a sign into the university every day which said that I was living in a nuclear-free city. As far as I know, Manchester is still nuclear-free, but more importantly, it's become age-friendly uh, whilst I've been working there. Um, and I, uh, I'm not sure about the nuclear-free bit. So I want to talk very quickly about uh, the uh, NHS long-term plan. And if, if dementia is about our brains, uh, and our bodies. I am particularly interested in the condition of frailty, which is kind of the other way around. It's our bodies and then our brains. And I think the two things work very much uh, in alignment and very grateful to uh, Jeremy and colleagues um, who have supported and helped us in developing proposals around uh, how we approach aging uh, in, in our country. Um, I think it's uh, something of a surprise to us that this is the first time, and I feel really privileged to be in the position uh, of saying that um, this is the first time that the NHS has actually had uh, a programme which focuses on older people and specifically on ageing. Kind of odd when you think about it because we are all ageing as we sit here right now continuously. It is part of being human. What are we trying to do through this? Well, really, I set out with the intention of just achieving two things, that uh, we need to end up in a position where the care that the NHS provides makes sense to people, and it is what they need, purely and simply that. At the moment, I think we are in a position where often that is not the case. Care does not make sense. It's not joined up. Uh, it is not continuous. Uh, as we've already heard, uh, you often get asked multiple times the same story, and it is tiresome, difficult, and confusing for people who are in receipt of care, but also caregivers and providers, and actually uh, professionals who work in services themselves. Also, we need to think about a needs-based service rather than what we think people want. Um, and I think there are lots of assumptions made in the health service about what we think people want. And actually, um, a needs-driven approach to care is, is very much about engaging people and, and asking them what actually it is, it is that you need today. So I think this is about changing the way we approach, approach health and social care. And the NHS long-term plan is a 10-year plan. It's funded for five years by government. And I think that gives us a really golden opportunity to embed some new care approaches uh, into our NHS and our social care system. And I have two key objectives in that. One is to um, support and enable people to age as well as they possibly can, but also simultaneously to meet the needs of people who uh, have not fared so well in life and who are uh, in need of greater support, despite the fact at the same age there may be people who are fitter than they are. So effectively, um, we're shifting the balance from talking about defunctioned, frail, elderly people in crisis. These are phrases that I want to see banished from the lexicon of health language. Uh, moving towards thinking about older people with vulnerabilities, but nevertheless something we can identify, we can engage with, we can help and support people to plan based on what their needs are and help them to anticipate the future, what lies ahead. And we can do that throughout the life course. But we have to do that in a timely fashion. One of the ways um, that we have to approach that is thinking about uh, ageing. So as I've said, it's, it's part of the human condition. We all do it. Um, but um, we are uh, seeing a situation where there are many more older people in society. In many ways, that's something to celebrate, of course. Um, the successes of modern health care, modern public health, uh, have enabled many more people to make it into their ninth and tenth decade in many cases. Um, but also, uh, we are we're seeing people acquiring lost function, disability. And that's something that we have to tackle. And this goes back to the point about what do people actually need. Uh, it's not just a health solution, therefore. The good news is that we don't all age in the same way. The bad news is we don't all age in the same way. If you look at this slide, what we've done is we've characterised people by age bands from 65 and above. If you look at the blue bits at the bottom, those are people who are ageing well. They don't have frailty. They are fit people. And if you look at the extreme right bottom corner, um, effectively what that says is that 20% of people age 19 and above are fit. 
they don't have any significant identifiable health issues and they are getting on well with their lives. If we think that success looks like pushing that, those numbers up, I think that is entirely achievable because that's actually the reality that we're living at the moment. We've seen this change over the last 20 or 30 years, even whilst I've been practicing medicine. The little bit at the top in yellow um, is the thing that we tend to concentrate on when we think about aging. These are people with severe frailty. And if you look at the left-hand top corner, even people who are uh, in their 60s, uh, and I think about myself approaching that part of my life uh, increasingly rapidly, it seems, uh, that actually uh, even people who we, no we now consider in their 60s, which is the new 40s, um, to be living with a degree of frailty. And frailty is a condition which increases your vulnerability to um, suddenly deteriorating and being left with an uncertain and unpredictable future with substantially more needs than you had even yesterday. So it's, it's an underlying predisposition. Now we can identify it, but we have to do it before those problems occur. And it's often precipitated into crisis for people by relatively minor events, a fall, a change of medication, a change of circumstances, even moving house, uh, the loss of a carer, can precipitate a person with severe frailty uh, into great difficulty when yesterday they were managing quite well. And the importance about that is that people with severe frailty versus a fit person of exactly the same age has almost five times the risk in year of death, entering hospital as an urgency, or entering permanent long-term care. So these are things that we need to tackle. What we've done at NHS England uh, over the last couple of years is start to embed this as a set of principles into society that we can find frailty, we can find fit people, and we can position services around them to meet their needs at those times in their life as their needs change. We've also worked out the cost of this. The cost of severe frailty per year in people over 65 is two, over two billion pounds. But if you look at the total cost of frailty spread across the entire population, um, it is well over 15 billion. So the size of the prize, if we were to prevent a degree of physical frailty uh, in some parts of the population is substantial. Equally, we have to understand how are we spending that two billion on severe frailty? Well, the answer is we're spending it more or less the same as we spend it on fit people. And I don't think that's right. This is um, a, a, an indication of the distributive spend across the bottom, uh, the degrees of severe, m moderate, uh, mild and fitness. So on the left, about half of our health and social care spend um, is on acute hospital care in the um, 65 and above group. That's probably about right. But over on the right-hand side, it's still the same. It's more or less 50%. And intuitively, we've grown a little bit more social care, a little bit more... Uh, community support for people, but actually those are people who need substantially more social care support, substantially <coughs> more support in their communities to live with functional needs. So we have to redistribute that spend in a way that's intelligent, not just based on intuition and demand of service pressures. And you can't possibly see this. I can't even see this stuff from here. But what this is really captures the fact that a few years ago, uh, without any fanfare, we put into the general practice contract in England a requirement that GPs routinely identify severe frailty and where they could moderate frailty. And we did that because there was an opportunity using existing healthcare record data to electronically synthesise somebody's risk of having frailty, to segment the population into groups of people who might be fit or might be severe frail and we asked GPs to go and look at those individuals and to validate using some uh, established tools whether or not they thought that person had those vulnerabilities and then to put it onto their GP record. We did this because we wanted to put frailty on the map just in the same way that dementia has been established as something that we need to concentrate and think about and approach differently. We put frailty on the map too. And what we were able to find, quite surprisingly, is this whole country data. We estimated there were 3% of the 65 and above population that was severe frail. And it was absolutely outstanding that I think we found 320,000 people in this country with severe frailty um, very, very quickly indeed, because this is done almost automatically. 
interestingly, um, GPs were so enthusiastic about this, they also went off and found a lot of the moderate frail people, which are a population we are particularly interested in with regards to the long-term pan. Across the country, this distributes very differently, and again, you can't see the detail in this, but I can tell you that on the left-hand side in West Yorkshire, there's a lot more frailty being found uh, than in Northamptonshire. And we know that the distribution of frailty across the country is unequal. It partly explains some of the inequalities agenda uh, that we have to address across the country, so it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all health service across the whole country. Mindful of that, we put in rather sneakily into the general practice uh, patient survey uh, last year, and I'm particularly proud of question 32. Look at it next time it drops onto your doorstep and fill it out, um, because it has a, uh, a phenotypic identifier, a way of characterising somebody who might rate themselves not as being frail, but as having some difficulties uh, with their physical mobility, uh, and possibly the risk of falling, feeling isolated. And we we characterised that back and thought, well, if pe people are complaining of two or three of these things or experiencing these things, uh, they may be at risk of having frailty. And we did this as a, a little bit of an experiment to see what would happen. Interestingly, it maps out where all of the problems are in terms of health inequalities across the country. Um, I was sitting in a conference a few weeks ago uh, when a colleague was presenting non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, as a condition uh, which is related to things like uh, poor diet, um, health inequalities, um, issues in local communities. Um, this is not alcohol related, it's related to things like um, the availability of, of poor quality calories. And he put up a map that showed the distribution of this condition across the country and I thought he had stolen my map of frailty because it's exactly the same places. We know that severe frailty um, distributes across the population in parts of the country where there are difficulties with housing, deprivation, worklessness, poor diet, uh, poor lifestyles. And those are in particular in the North and Midlands and in the South West. So we have to think about local communities. This is not necessarily a single solution across the whole NHS. We also found in this work that some people reported themselves as possibly frail, put that in inverted commas, it's not particularly scientific, um, but uh, in their 20s and 30s. And we know that's true because people with frailty have been described around the, around the world um, from teens onwards. It's a physical condition to a large extent. We also know um, that, um, as I've said, uh, deprivation seems to particularly predispose this condition. So at the moment, we're treating all older people the same. And what we find is when they leave hospital um, that we overprescribe um, the solutions outside of hospital because we are somewhat risk averse when we discharge. So people go to care homes rather than to their own home. They go into rehabilitation beds in the community rather than their own home to rehabilitate. And through the NHS long-term plan, uh, we sought to address this in a number of very specific ways. We tend to think about the demands on social care, and I don't want to uh, duck that particular issue. The NHS long-term plan is written very much with the intention that we do this very much in partnership with uh, not just social care um, in terms of commissioning, but also providers, and also with, most importantly, I think, communities and a charitable and voluntary sector, sector across the country. As I say, the richness that's in local communities, I think, will also help us deal with some of these issues of uh, unequal distribution of frailty across the country. I would also say that in many cases, the things that drive frailty are also similar to the things that drive cognitive disorder, in particular dementia and delirium. So we've been very tactical about this. We've put frailty on the map through the general practice contract, and in the NHS long-term plan, we've introduced a new programme. This is the first ageing programme in the NHS ever. And it has three things in it, and they are very specific. The first is that for people who are in crisis in their communities and need an urgent response, they need it pretty much now. And at the moment, we have nice standards that say you should get a crisis response in two hours, but we're not delivering that. People are waiting many hours just to be assessed. So we've put a very challenging new uh, standard. I was going to use the target word. That will use the target word, actually. Uh, a new target in which says that uh, within two hours of a need being identified, uh, a person receives crisis response in their own home, be that a care home or their own home in the community. 
Also, if you are recovering from an illness, you need to be supported, and so two days to get reablement services, either to support you to leave hospital when you no longer need care in hospital, or to avoid the need for hospital in the first place, that actually you can be supported to recover in your own community. But you need that quickly. You don't want to be waiting around for days on end. We know, for instance, that in hospital, 10 years of life is taken off by 10 days of immobility in a hospital bed. So reablement is really, really important, but you have to get it quickly. It's very time sensitive. Secondly, we have 450,000 beds in the UK um, in the uh, care sector. We have significantly fewer staff working in that sector. That's three times the number of beds that the NHS has. And we have moved a lot of older people, a lot of people with cognitive disorder. My colleague Alistair Burns uh, estimates up to 70% of people in care homes have cognitive disorder and dementia. And yet we haven't engineered a proper supportive health intervention and solution um, to support those people in an equitable fashion uh, in those care homes. And those are people with substantial physical and cognitive need. So we are putting forward a, uh, an enhanced offer of health into care homes, specifically targeting um, health inputs into care homes to support. That's not just something that the health industry does on its own, it has to do it in partnership. Uh, and there are many successful examples of where that's working already around the country. We think that there is an enhanced offer of health support to care homes in about 50% um, of care homes around the country at the moment. But we don't know the breadth and depth and quality of that, and we really need to drive that over the next five and ten years. Thirdly, we um, are seeking those people that I referenced earlier with moderate frailty and putting multidisciplinary assessments. These are people that we can support to age better. We can actually, in some cases, through simple interventions, modify their frailty, make them fitter, um, enable them to uh, offset their um, poor quality aging and improve their prospects in life, um, but also identify those people um, who are transiting up into severe frailty and help them to plan for the future. And that's about putting multidisciplinary teams all over the country in primary care networks. These are the new, small, community-driven networks of healthcare uh, around the country um, on populations of no more than 30 or 50,000 people, um, and finding those people with moderate frailty and helping them to age well. This is our delivery map. Um, again, you can't possibly see this. Uh, this is intentionally vague uh, as, a, as an NHS slide. Um, if you were to click on some of this, you might see something that I wouldn't wish you to see. Um, but I have highlighted the most important But If you look at the, the uh, orange trajectory, that is the two-hour, two-day standard. We believe this is the most important part, and we want to get there by 23, 24. We don't know exactly what the baseline is for the rest of the country for the other components. We have a really good baseline around... Uh, intermediate care services from which this two-hour, two-day standard will be delivered, and that's where we want to go first. But that's not to say we will not be supporting and working on care homes in the background. Whilst it looks quite a flat curve there, actually we're already building off a reasonably good base, um, but we need to spend the next few years working out exactly where to position those services to get the best benefit across the country. This is another complicated diagram that NHS England came up with, which effectively says that we can't deliver this just in local communities. The community multidisciplinary teams will be in local communities because it needs to be near to where you live. The same for um, the care homes support, but actually delivering and supporting uh, the crisis response and reopenment services has to be done at a much bigger system level. And we're working very closely with the urgent emergency care system uh, to do that. Um, so this is a whole system uh, piece of work. In order to actually solve that particular challenge of two hours and two days, it requires all of health, social care, voluntary sector, urgent services, primary care services, secondary care, hospitals, all to work together. And I think that's really the, the important challenge here, that it drives parts of the health and social care system together to scratch their heads and think about how to solve this. We fully believe this is deliverable, and in fact we know in some parts of the country this is already happening. 
There are a whole load of things that we're asking systems to do at the moment. And in terms of implementation of this, um, we have spent most of the last year um, creating these plans. Uh, this is only one part of the NHS long-term plan, of course, but it is a substantial policy commitment. You will have heard the announcement last year uh, by our Prime Minister of 3.5 billion being invested into primary and community services. There was nobody more surprised than I was to read the long-term plan which said 4.5 billion was being invested in primary and community services. And I think that that is testament to the fact uh, that uh, Department of Health, Social Care, our ministers and NHS England and Improvement really understand the value and importance of investing in our community and primary care services um, to deliver this and many other components of healthcare much closer to people's own homes. Something we've talked about for the last 20 or 30 years but haven't intentionally been able to deliver. To wire all of that up requires substantial amounts of effort and work. As I say, these are 10-year plans funded for the next five years, and we are hitting the ground running with this. Over the next few months, there will be implementation guidance um, going out to systems, and we really do want to work with everybody in this. This is, as I say, not just an NHS piece of work now. So by autumn of this year, the NHS will have uh, sorted out its local plans, um, as to how they're going to do this. And, and the thing that I will leave you with is that, and I think the real opportunity we have here is that this is about a, a longer term plan. It's in the title. It's not just boom and bust year on year, take something up, take it down again the next year. It's about sustained, planned, intentional uh, developing services. And most importantly, from my perspective, it's about developing services which we can embed, we know are effective, we know work, and we know it will support people with frailty and with cognitive disorder and dementia uh, to age well and to live well right the way through to the end of their lives. And I would hope and expect that by 10 years' time we'll be in a much, much better position than we are now. But we have a substantial piece of work to do in the interim. And I would certainly use this as an opportunity to engage with and ask everybody here to support us in that because we cannot do this on our own. Um, but we can do it uh, together and in collaboration. Thank you.